Hello and welcome to the first tutorial in this Intermediate Flask course. Today we'll be covering JSON Web Tokens. In order to focus on implementing the tokens themselves, the surrounding code will be for demonstration and education only. Please do not use it for production, as it's insecure. After covering implementing JWT, the next tutorial will be building a full project that is production ready and is secure. JSON Web Tokens are an open standard that defines a compact and self-contained way for securely transmitting information between parties as a JSON object. It's digitally signed and so can be verified and trusted. We'll be showing the default way of doing this using a secret key with the hash-based message authentication code using the SHA-256 hash algorithm, which we'll describe later. JSON Web Tokens have three parts separated by dots. The first part is the header, the second part the payload, and the last part the signature. The header has the cryptographic algorithm. The payload is the information such as the name and the expiration time of the token in seconds past the Unix epoch. The signature is our secret key. It is possible to also use a different cryptographic algorithm, and instead of signing with a secret key, you can use public-private key pairs using RSA for instance. Okay, so first things first, we're in PyCharm and we'll create a blank Flask project. This is just a shortcut for manually creating a new environment, activating that environment and then pip installing Flask. We'll also need to pip install PyJWT. PyJWT is a Python library that allows you to encode and decode JSON web tokens. It's easy to use and I'll show you how today. We're focusing exclusively on using JSON web tokens, so this program itself is bare bones, consisting of a single Python file, app.py, and we'll add an HTML template later on. Let's start by making sure our setup is correct, and that we haven't made any errors creating this project. We have our Flask project running, and can see that localhost on port 5000 at the root level returns hello world. We'll run in debug mode so that it automatically restarts after we make any changes. We change the return value to custom and can see that all is well. Here, all we're doing in the console is importing our app module that we're writing, importing pretty print, and then printing the contents of the config attribute. The app that we've created on line three has a config attribute that's a dictionary subclass modifiable as any other dictionary can be. It has keys such as debug, which can have the value true or false, which does what you would expect it to with the values true or false, JSONify MIME type, which defaults to application JSON and is the MIME type of JSONify responses, and max cookie size, which gives a warning if cookie headers are larger than the value in bytes, and it defaults to 4093. Only keys in all uppercase are stored. Flask is designed to usually have the configuration available as soon as the application starts up. In this example, we've hard-coded our key of interest, secret key. When we move on to larger applications, we'll see that there are better ways to store and load configuration. These are the built-in configuration items. We can see that secret key is used for securely signing the session cookie and other security related needs. It should be a long random string of bytes and the documentation gives one way of doing this using the OS built-in module. As mentioned before, here we'll just hard code it to make it easier to see what's going on. We're going to write a decorator function. Decorators are fundamental in transforming your ability in Flask to the next level. They're used extensively by the Flask framework and the extensions to register application provided functions as callbacks. For example, in Flask, we have root, which registers functions to handle roots, before request, which registers a function to run before request handlers. Before first request, that's similar, but only once at the start. After request, which registers a function to run after request handlers have run. Teardown request registers a function to run after request handlers run, even if they throw an exception. 
error handler defines a custom error handler. We'll call our function check for token. Our aim with this decorator is to be able to decorate our functions that are normally decorated with app.root. And what they'll do is decline access to web pages if the user doesn't have and provide the appropriate JWT, JSON Web Token. Customize it so that there's a time limit for valid tokens. We wrap our inner function with functools.wraps. Ensure that we can decorate any function with any positional arguments and any keyword only arguments. And in our wrapped function, we'll define a variable token to which will be assigned the value of the key token. So for instance, when we visit our page that we want to be private, we'll type in our URL followed by a question mark token, which is the key, and then the value, which will be our token. That value will be assigned to our variable token here. If token evaluates to false, i.e. is empty, then we'll return a JSON response of one key value pair message missing token, and it's a 403 error. Then we attempt to decode the token with the decode method of JWT. The first argument of JWT.decode is the encoded token. The second argument is the secret key. And there is an optional third argument, which is the algorithm. It defaults to HS256, which is hash-based message authentication code HMAC using the SHA-256 hash algorithm. Message authentication code is a piece of information used to authenticate a message, protecting its authenticity and integrity. HMAC does this involving a cryptographic hash function and a secret key, increasing its strength. These are the algorithms supported. We've wrapped this in an exception handler so that if there's a problem with the token provided, our program doesn't stop running. If you haven't already done so, I urge you to take a look at our exception handling masterclass to see why leaving an accept by itself without narrowing down the exceptions caught makes debugging so much more difficult. In this small working teaching example, we'll get away with it. These are the custom exceptions potentially raised by JWT. We finish our decorator as normal, returning func and then returning wrapped, ready to be called downstream. Let's change the hello world function to be called index, and we'll code some simple logic whereby if the user isn't logged in, i.e. the value for the key logged in stored in the dictionary-like object, session is false, then we'll render the login.html page for them. If logged in is true, then we'll simply return currently logged in. Next, we'll add two more functions, one for public and another for private. We code the public function as normal, but we'll decorate our private authorized function with our check for token decorator. The page with the text, this is only viewable with a token, is just that. It's only viewable if a current non-expired token is passed in. We need one more function. This is what will receive the post request from our login page. We'll keep this bit really simple so as not to detract from the focus of this tutorial, which is JWT. As long as we enter anything in the username form and the password as password, then it will let us log in. We change the value of session logged in to true. Then encode a token for the user. We pass in a dictionary as the first argument containing both a username, which is taken straight from the form, and an expiration condition. We tell JWT when we want the token encoded to expire, i.e. no longer be valid. And we do it by passing in seconds past the Unix epoch. So we get the current time, then add the amount of time from now that we want the token to be valid for. We'll put 60 seconds so that we can see it in action. In real life, you want an amount of time that isn't so short as to be impractical for the user, but not so long as to render making an expiration date to the token irrelevant. 
Finally, we pass in our secret key. If the user is unable to log in, then we'll return a standard 403 response informing them of the need to log in. All that's left now for us to do is to mock up a simple form taking in a username and a password and a submit button. Now, the moment of truth. We enter Adam as the username and password as the password, and we get our token. The private part of our site is at the auth path, so we enter that and then pass in our token. And it works! We are into the private part of the site. Recall that our token is only valid for 60 seconds, so let's refresh again and again and see it expire. The token is now invalid. The JWT website has a GUI, a graphical user interface, which is another way of seeing that our token contains the payload, Adam, password. But by itself, it tells us that it's an invalid signature. We need to enter our secret key as well in order to verify that it's valid. When we enter our valid secret key, it confirms that the signature is now valid. This is another reason for not actually wanting to hard code the secret key in the code of our project itself. I hope you enjoyed the first installment of our dedicated Intermediate Flask course. In the next tutorial, we'll see how we can implement a full project with code that's secure and production ready, i.e. doesn't have the obvious flaws of this example. If there's anything specific that you'd like me to cover, let me know and I'll do my best to accommodate it.